Hello everyone, welcome to uh, episode two of our Dermalux D Difference webinar series, where today we're going to be discussing better treatment outcomes with Dermalux. We had such a fantastic response to episode one, and if you missed it, it's available to watch on our YouTube channel now. I'm Louise Taylor from Dermalux, and joining me today I have two very special guests, so Vanessa Brown and Dr. Abs from VL Aesthetics up in Carlisle. So Vanessa and Dr. Abs are going to be sharing their thoughts about how important LED phototherapy is for a skincare business. We're going to be sharing some protocols and also some results that they've achieved across various skin conditions. So we've got a lot to talk about today. And if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to put those in the chat. We will have a look at answering those as we go through and, and also at the end. Um, so I'm now going to hand over to Vanessa and Dr. Abs and let them introduce themselves to you. Thank you both. Hi, thanks everyone for joining us today. My name is Vanessa and I own and run VL Aesthetics, which is an award-winning skin, body and laser clinic located in Carlisle, which is in Cumbria in the north of England. Um, today we're joined by Dr. Abs, who's our aesthetic doctor, and we're going to chat you through why um, Dermalux is such an integral part of the business. Um, so Dr. Abs, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, hi everyone, my name is Dr. Abs. Um, as Vanessa said, I work with her <coughs> at uh, VL Aesthetics in Carlisle. Uh, I'm based in, in Carlisle and Leeds mainly. I work around the UK. I work internationally sometimes. Um, I provide clinical treatments for my own patients. I teach at uh, university level. I teach other professionals. Uh, I'm involved in research and clinical trials and things. And uh, for me personally, um, of, of all the sort of thousands and thousands of cases I've done, all the huge amount of papers and books that I constantly read, um, for me, LED therapy is something that is definitely in the future of cosmetic medicine. Um, and I will try and use it wherever possible for many, many reasons, um, most of which hopefully we're going to go through today. Yeah. So should we maybe kickstart the webinar by talking through why you as a practice, as a clinician, should take LED so seriously? I think um, quite a lot of people often think that LED is an add on probably because it's been marketed in that way to clinics for a number of years. However, yeah. we believe that LED should be more than an add-on and it should literally become part of every single client's journey with you in the business. So do you want to maybe start by explaining why it is such an important part of the business and not yeah. simply an add-on? Sure. So LEDs, um, unfortunately, I don't think there's been enough time since LEDs became so phenomenal. Um, for everyone to really understand what they're capable of. Um, so I, I believe in you know, it a, a long time ago when LEDs first started, they were generally, you know, I think it was, um, it was red, yellow, and green or something like that. And then sometime in the nineties, they developed the ability to make blue and then they were able to make white light and, and things grew from there. And then they realized in the same way that leaves and plants that contain chlorophyll the sun can hit that molecule and cause changes. And that's how plants live. That's, that's how they respire, generate energy. And then we realize actually a similar thing happens in human tissues as well, when you're able to very finely control the wavelengths of light that are penetrating those tissues. And then we realize actually LEDs can do this. And that's, that's when things kind of grew. Um, and when, when you are able to create things so finely in terms of the wavelength, the intensity, the time, uh, et cetera, et cetera, you can guarantee that these results in a, in a sense. And when you understand, when, when people understood that in these tissues of ours, we have certain molecules, for example, we have, you know, an area in the cell where energy is generated. There's a, there's a chain of about four things, four molecules, four complexes, and then there's a sort of machine at the end. And we found that when red light is, is hit onto human tissues, it can trigger this fourth complex. It's called cytochrome C oxidase. And that is something that allows the cell to then carry out its function. Because if you think of what energy production means, energy production means the cell is able to do all the things a cell should be able to do. And so that's acting as a sort of human version of chlorophyll in a plant. It's reacting and being stimulated by radiation. In the plant's case, it's the sun. In our case, it's in now with the things like Demlux, it's LED therapy. So once we realized we could do this, we realized then, you know, the, the next step to do is to figure out what changes we can create using what specific wavelengths or types of light. Um, and that's when things really started to take off. And we realized, you know, we can use this wavelength and this wavelength and this wavelength and create X, Y, Z changes in the skin. And only now we're starting to realize how consistently we can do that and how well we can do that 
which is why LED therapy is not an add-on treatment per se anymore. It is a treatment in its own right, because when you can trigger the cell to act and behave in certain ways, at the end of the day, when you think about it, that's how you treat any condition. Because any drug that you give, any topical skincare product that you apply, you're doing that to create behavior within a cell or a group of cells. The more ways you can do that, especially the more ways with less risk, less invasiveness, and things like that, for example, with the Dermalux, the better off your patient can be. And so that's why LED therapy should be taken seriously, and specifically why the Dermalux should be taken seriously as well. Yeah, absolutely. So we introduced the, the Dermalux with the TriWave MD back in September last year. So just at the kind of end of, of that first lockdown. Um, do you maybe want to talk through the reasons as to why we, we chose Dermalux um, in particular, why we went for the TriWave MD as opposed to maybe something else? Yeah, sure. So in, in chemistry, a, a reaction or a change only occurs when there is enough energy in the system to cause that change. Um, so for example, if you're going to throw, if, if you're an athlete, for instance, and you're going to throw, um, if you're gonna do the long jump, okay, you need to run with enough speed to be able to jump off that board and actually have any distance in the sandpit. If there's no speed, if there's no energy, you're not going anywhere. And chemical reactions are the same. When you write a chemical reaction out in formula, you have product A or reactants A and B, go to products C and D. And the only way they go there is if there's enough energy put in the system. So when you're causing changes in the cell <clears throat> and using light to trigger those changes, they will only occur if the light is good enough quality and contains enough energy for that to occur. So it stands to reason that the quality of the LED, which is what's producing that light, is of utmost importance. So you know why did we choose a Dermalux? Because we want the best quality LEDs to create the best quality light, to create the best quality clinical results and have the best quality reputation for our clinic. <clears throat> Ultimately, the quality of your clinic is, de is determined by the quality of the LED in this case. And when LEDs are manufactured, they are put out on the production line and then they're tested for how, how accurately they can produce whichever reaction or whichever wavelength of light you'd, you'd like them to produce. And the accuracy is then given a number, shall we say. Everything, when it's a certain accuracy, goes into this box. Everything else goes into that box. Dermalux get the first dibs, so they get the best. Everyone else gets the stuff that Dermalux don't want. They get the scraps, okay? Yeah. Now, if you're trying to compete with an LED, by, by creating an LED device, how on earth are you going to create anything that will generate a clinical result if all you're working with is stuff that no one else wants in, in the first place? Frankly, you, you can't. Yeah. So there's there's no alternative for me. It, it is a Dermalux or nothing. Yeah, absolutely. So that is fundamentally why we chose that. And the reason we chose obviously the TriWave is the amount of power that it can generate in, in a short space of time and therefore speed up results, obviously, for our clients and for our patients as well. Yeah. Now, um, I, you know, Dale, who is one of the, the key figures at Aesthetic Technology, the, the manufacturer of the Dermalux, um, if I'm not mistaken, he was involved in the QLED screen that um, Samsung have for their phones. He's got a lot of history in LED technology and he knows what he's doing. If you were to use your phone for 30 minutes continuously doing some high powered thing like editing videos or, or whatever, or even taking a video, you can feel in your hand that's really quite hot. And when you put it in your pocket, you're gonna get a warm leg after a while because of, of the amount of heat that it's generating. And that's just a tiny phone. Multiply that several fold to get the amount of LED panels that you have in an LED device like the Dermalux. And it stands to reason that you're now going to be generating multiple times the heat as well. That heat needs to go somewhere. If it's not dissipated, the efficiency of the light then production is, is going to be detracted from. So that's why the Dermalux has such massive amounts of fans on the back. It has to dissipate that heat. If your device doesn't have that heat dissipation mechanism or thermal dissipation mechanism, then it's, you know, it's not needed which means if it's not needed, how, how are they doing it? The LEDs clearly aren't generating a lot of good quality light then if, if it's not needed. So just by the design of the, the machine, you can tell what's high quality and what's not. And the Dermalux, you know, you, you can see it for yourself, the amount of fans that are on it. Yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. W one of the main reasons um, I would recommend the Dermalux is when you teach people what's actually going on um, in, a, in a scientific context, in a biological context, 
you then no longer need to tell them why the Demolux is the best thing because they realize it themselves without needing to be told. That's a much more powerful way of, of, of carrying out your treatments, I think. Mm -hmm. So the way I like to teach, especially my students, I, I will always tell them, you know, if you imagine that you are a cell, imagine that you are a fibroblast in the dermis of someone's skin, you are going to be interacted with, with say, vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, oxygen, and in this case, specific wavelengths of light. Now, you couldn't care less what the device that has produced that light looks like, because when it's in contact with the cell membrane, where it was produced now means nothing, because it's not in contact with that anymore, it's in contact with you. So it doesn't matter what logo the device has, it doesn't matter what color it is, which celebrity has endorsed it, what magazine it's been featured in. At the end of the day, the cell just cares about the physics and the chemistry of, of what's happening to itself and nothing else. So when you understand that, you understand that it's more important to look at the biology rather than the marketing and, and everything else. Mm -hmm. And once you understand that, you realize actually this is this really is the best machine because you can have a great looking machine that costs a lot of money, but if the cellular interaction is poor, you're going to get a zero result. And, yeah. and that's the most important thing. Um, so for example, um, if you look at um, a balloon filled with water, you gently you know, throw it up in the air and catch it, it's not going to do anything. You throw it a bit higher, when it lands in your hand, it might sort of take the shape of your hand and then come back to a, to a ball. And then if you throw it really high, and it lands, it's going to hit with so much energy that it shatters and you get wet everywhere, okay? The reason for that, when you throw it much higher, it's now got a lot more energy. So when it hits your hand, the bigger impact means a change occurs. And if your light interacting with your cell or your subcellular organelle is not high enough energy or good quality energy, no balloon is going to get smashed and no change is going to occur. If you are too underpowered, if it's too low quality or not enough energy, nothing's going to happen. If it's yeah. too much, then you venture into the realms of lasers has to be just right for not just LED therapy, but good quality LED therapy. So you can have a competitor that makes a certain product. You switch it on and it provides good quality wavelengths for 20 seconds, 30 seconds. There's a big difference between that and then leaving it on for a full 20 minutes, 30 minute session where because it, it can't dissipate its heat very well for as an example, it overheats and then the quality of the light goes down as the treatment progresses and you, you can't have that that's a complete waste of time for everyone then <clears throat> and sometimes you have to use multiple wavelengths together because they all achieve different things so you need to be able to trust your machine that a the wavelengths are correct okay they have to have scientific evidence behind them they have to be produced cleanly and they have to be sustained over time without a loss or a drop in quality of those wavelengths there's only the dermalux that is capable of doing that and when you go into all the different wavelengths you'll understand that even more. Yeah, definitely. So do you maybe want to start by explaining what exactly um, the blue light does um, and maybe touch upon obviously how the blue light can be effective at treating problematic skin such as acne? Okay, so the, the blue light um, in the Dermalux is 415 nanometers and <clears throat> that has antibacterial effects and it's, it's good for acne because Acne, one, one cause of acne, shall we say, is bacteria, Propionibacterium acnes, P acnes. That's one of the things that is, that is responsible for these breakouts, for these pimples, et cetera, that, that you know, people hate. So if the light can safely destroy this, these bacteria, you are completely eradicating one of the major factors that has led to the condition, which your patient is coming in for. But crucially, they've done it without drugs. They've done it without breaking the skin and injecting anything. There's no major risk because it's just light at the end of the day. They've not had to exert too much effort. They just sit there and lie down and they're going to get a fantastic result because it's, it's such a sheer eradication of all these bacteria. Yeah. So you can get such a fantastic result, but with practically no risk and no effort required. And, and that's so significant. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So skin condition number two um, pigmentation. How um, can we successfully treat pigmentation by using the Dermalux Triwave? Sure, so pigmentation, I think that's probably one of the most common concerns that many people have, you know, yeah. especially people of, of my skin type, higher Fitzpatrick skin types, four, five, six, 
uh, for example, were much more prone to things like post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. And that is something which occurs, it's a defense mechanism of the skin. That's why we tan. A tan is actually just a defense mechanism. We're, we're trying to create this umbrella on, on our skin that protects precious things like the DNA underneath that melanin, which yeah. is that biological umbrella. So that absorbs the light instead of the DNA, which can then be damaged as a result of absor absorbing that light. So one of the ways we can stop the pigmentation is by simply reducing the body's need to inflame. So post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, as, as one example of pigmentation, as the name suggests, comes as a result of inflammation. The body is reacting to it, thinking it's under harm. So if you can control that immune response, you're going to get a much better result. So if you create, you know, so a treatment protocol of around 830 nanometers, even leading up to the traumatic event, such as a, a peel, for instance, mm -hmm. you're going to you're going to calm that skin before anything happens. So you're you're in a much better position to reduce the risk of PIH. Yeah. I would I wouldn't use it immediately after a peel necessarily it depends on the case. Uh, but you can use it following that as well to again reduce the inflammatory response. Now I mentioned at the start of this that um, in 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 our cells we have this sequence of events, complex one, two, three, and four, and then we have this little machine called ATP synthase. This is the target for red light at the dermalux at 630 nanometers. Now when when this light hits complex four, which is cytochrome C oxidase, that's the final step before energy is actually created. Now this can be clogged up, as I said, with things like nitric oxide. And that actually is a trigger for inflammatory cascades. And that creates an immune response. Um, you, you see cytokines, um, things like that, which, which can interleukins, um, tumor necrosis factors, tumor, ne tumor necrosis factor alpha. These things are, are what tell the body trauma is occurring, something is wrong. It, it generates that immune response, that inflammatory response. And this is why, for me personally, I think the NIR setting on the Dermalux is, is groundbreaking and it's, it's so amazing. Yeah. I'll put it to you this way. If any of you have children, then you will understand that if they cut themselves or fall over, they, they graze their, their hand, knee, whatever, you're gonna see a mark, but then probably in a couple of days, it's almost completely disappeared. And you're almost jealous because they can heal so quickly and so well. Whereas the same thing happened to you, you would have that mark for months, maybe years, depending on uh, the size of the trauma. Now the stimulus can be the same for you and your child or an adult and a child, but the response is incredibly different. And when we look at what happens on a cellular level to create these differences, it's because the cellular response, among other things, it's because the cellular response is very, very different. Different cells are called upon. And when we really analyze these things, we look at actually it's partly also to do with inflammation. So that's why, for instance, when you have a trauma to the skin that's really quite severe, you might get scar tissue because the body thinks it's, it's that traumatic that it immediately lays down collagen and it lays down collagen in a line as opposed to like a, like a basket weave. Yeah. That's why scar tissue is strong in one direction. It's, it's a body's response to that trauma thinking it's gonna happen again. Mm -hmm. If you cause too much inflammation, you're going to get things like this. That's why I think it's very wrong that when people do things like microneedling, they say, oh, the more inflammation, the better. Well, if that's the case, why is it that people with psoriasis and actinic keratoses don't have the best skin in the world? I mean, they clearly don't. And when you look at people that heal scarless, it's actually because they're inflaming less. So yeah. when you are creating procedures and treatments for patients that have the ability to inflame, and you can then control that inflammation using 830 nanometer wavelengths yeah. on the Thermalux, you are so much less likely to cause scar tissue, redness, soreness, post-inflammatory uh, post hyperpigmentation, post-op pain, things like that. There's, there's many, many things that it can actually prevent in, in the best way possible. Absolutely. Um, just a quick one. With question and answers we're going to do them at the end um I didn't mention okay. that we're going to answer them all at the end so if you've got any questions as we're talking please obviously just put them in the chat and we will go through each one at the end um mm -hmm. that's probably just the easiest way to do it so we don't kind of end up um, missing any questions or repeating ourselves as we're having having a chat okay um 
one of the the things that I think that you do differently to other um I want to say other aesthetic practitioners out there is the fact that you look at the skin you don't just um inject people and then say see you in three months time that's really not how how we do things um so why as why as an aesthetic practitioner an aesthetic doctor etc cetera, etc cetera, is it so so important to to look at the fundamental skin health first before you begin any sort of treatment plan that you you choose to do for the patient okay so if you understand fundamental skin health what you're saying as a result of that is that you understand anatomy of the skin and if you understand anatomy of the skin you can go deeper than that you can say okay well the, uh, this depth is this cell at that depth there's that cell etc but then if you go deeper than that you understand subcellular components intracellular organelles uh, and how they work and how things feed each other and essentially the biology of, of skin uh, of cell tissues and cell signaling and all this kind of thing so once you understand things like that and you understand that actually um, you know you have this cell in the dermis fibroblast let's say uh, and its products include hyaluronic acid collagen elastin etc when you understand that all those things are made by the same cell and there's a problem with all of them you can look at that person and say actually it's probably probably because that individual cell isn't functioning is it because it's not being fed right and i know what it needs because i know it needs these inputs to create these outputs is it because its depth is shallower than it should be because there's not enough of a barrier function there's not enough stratum corneum because there are too many peels so they've lost that barrier function once you understand the biology in this context not just anatomy but the, the, the function of that anatomy it, it actually becomes very, very easy to treat people. And it becomes very, very easy to understand why treatments like the Dermalux are so good because they're so risk-free, relatively speaking at least, but also because they can do things which other things just can't do. Yeah. I mean, the ability to trigger the electron transport chain, the ability to trigger the exact chain that is responsible for the activity of a cell. How many, how many, um, how many treatments are there that can do that so accurately and so well and so consistently and safely as well exactly I, I would argue either none or next to none yeah but once you see that you understand actually you can treat so many things with this and part of the reason my, you know my favorite setting is the nir the 830 because when you look at different skin conditions acne um scar formation um psoriasis etc at their core they are all the same. They are all some sort of inflammation. And that's why inflammation is so responsible for so many different problems that we have. And once you understand that, by controlling inflammation, as opposed to trying to control psoriasis or acne, you're actually going to get everything all at the same time. And because you're reducing that inflammatory response, the chances of post-treatment problems also reduce at the same time. Now, one of the reasons this 830 works so well is because in this electron transport chain where cytochrome C oxidase is hit with light from the dermalux, um, if it's clogged up by nitric oxide, which is one thing that happens during the inflammatory process, that then triggers other things to happen. That then triggers um, things that are making much more likely for scars to form, for post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, etc. When you fire 830 nanometer light at, at this particular molecule in the electron transport chain, that's when it, that NO gets knocked out, the nitro, nitric oxide gets knocked out, and then oxygen takes its place. So respiration can continue. So the cell's ability to act is not interrupted. When it's interrupted and stopped and all these inflammatory processes take place, that's when you get all sorts of problems. That's why people get post-op problems and scars and things like that. So by controlling that, you are healing much more like a child than an adult. That It's the difference between an adult versus an embryo healing model you can tip the scale so you heal more like a child than an adult because you're controlling inflammation so well. That's why when I do skincare for a lot of people, whether it's preparation for Dermalox or otherwise, yeah. I will pay so much attention to the inflammation that's present. I will use a lot of things like modulating glucosides to reduce that inflammatory response in the skin. Once you do that, you're gonna get much better results in so many different things. Yeah, definitely. What, um, so do you maybe want to talk through what kind of um, injectable treatments would you suggest to use near infrared light afterwards? Sure. So any, any kind of injectable treatment is going to traumatize the skin because it's, as the name suggests, going to inject, it's going to pierce the skin. Yeah. Anytime you do that, you will release factors in the skin that are immune in origin, shall we say, that are potentially going to cause some kind of inflammation. So anything that breaks the skin 
that is prone to some sort of inflammation or swelling or immune response yeah. can be helped with NIR. It may not increase the quality of the results um, that is given as a result of injecting ingredient X into the skin, whatever it may be, but it will increase the body's ability to accept that in the skin without reacting badly, shall we say. Um, as well as that, you know, the dermalux, the antibacterial effect, if you use, say, the blue and the infrared, something like that. After, let's say someone has, is having lip fillers. When we break the skin near this area, we are leaving open the possibility of herpes simplex virus spread. And um, if someone has a history of this, it's something that you, you're going to need to talk about in the consultation. And you may prescribe, if you're able to do prescriptions, you may prescribe something like acyclovir to reduce the viral load. However, if you can also reduce the viral load with immediate treatment with a Dermalux straight after, there has been evidence to suggest it has an antiviral effect as well. So again, it's, it's, it stops bacterial breakout, it stops inflammation, it just allows your skin to sit nicer and not be irritated by other things. Yeah. Okay, so we do um, we do microneedling a lot in the clinic. It's probably one of our favorite um, treatments to recommend for a number of different reasons. We won't go into why. Um, and one of the things that got me at the very, very start when we introduced Dermalux is I'm not gonna name a specific manufacturer, but this specific manufacturer of a mechanical microneedling device said, no, you cannot put anything else on the skin after you finish needling the skin. That, that, that is a very, very common answer if, if anyone else does microneedling in the clinic. Um, what's kind of your take from, from a scientific point of view as to why that is, well, wrong, pretty much? It's completely wrong. Yeah. Um, and I, I would love to debate someone that thinks that yeah. otherwise. Yeah. Um, but okay, let me put it to you this way. If you're microneedling with what, whatever device you're using, be it a pen, be it a roller, whatever your preference is. Hopefully it's a roller because that's better, but I won't go into that. But let's, yeah. let's, let's, Read up his <laughs> thesis let's, on let's that, pretend, maybe. Let's pretend you've inflamed the skin to some extent. Um, you are going to have some kind of response in the skin, most likely some kind of immune response. Whether it's a, a big one or a small one, it remains to be seen. It depends on how much trauma you're causing in the skin. If you are traumatizing to the point where there is a, a greater immune response, you will trigger a lot more uh, sequential cascades in the skin, which can result in things like hyperpigmentation, scar tissue formation, uh, redness, just generalized inflammation, erythema, things like that. If you can settle that down, you allow your skin to actually accept whatever ingredients you're putting into the skin. Now, in terms of how you combine the Dermalux with, the, with microneedling, um, it's a very specific way, and it will take a lot an incredibly huge amount for anyone to change the way I do it. Once the skin has been punctured with however you'd like to do it, I will take off whatever blood there is. Now you may think, oh, but you want the blood. If I'm using the Dermalux, no, I don't want it there because the blood will clot. If that clot is present on the skin, especially in, a, in, in large quantities, that is acting as an umbrella that's shielding the skin from the Dermalux. And the whole point of putting Dermalux there is that it isn't shielded. It can actually touch the skin. The light can reach the skin. So I will needle, I will not put anything on the skin. I will simply clear what blood there is. Now, before the patient comes in, I will make sure the Dermalux is at the right setting. If the patient's head is on the chair or the bench here, I will get the Dermalux right next to them. So as soon as I lift my roller away from the skin, I immediately get the Dermalux straight away. I don't wanna wait more than five, 10 seconds. It's straight away on, and then I will put it to whatever setting I would like. Then while that's on for roughly 10 minutes, um, if it's microneedling, I personally would like to use, say, a combination of blue light um, at 415 for the antibacterial effects. I don't want bacteria getting in there. And I would also like to use, say, the near infrared because I want to calm the immune response. I'll put both of those together for 10 minutes in a custom protocol. That will give me somewhere between, say, 55 and 60 joules of energy. And that's enough for me. I, I, th I think that's probably best um, af after that treatment. While that Dermalux is on there, I will then get ready whatever I would like to put on the skin. Yeah. So that as soon as the, the timer runs out, I lift the Dermalux straight away off and then I put my topical ingredients on. Now, depending on which scientific paper you read or would like to quote, there is a certain amount of time as a window where these punctures that you make in the skin will stay open. Um, for me, I don't like to leave it more than 15 minutes. That's why I like to leave the Dermalux on for maximum 10. 
So as soon as that comes off, I've got a maximum of five minutes to get my topical ingredients into the skin. Yeah. Now it will only take me about two minutes or so because I'm not going to put a huge amount in there. Um, but with that protocol, I'm getting the, the ingredients in there with the punctures. And I'm also limiting how badly my skin will react by calming the skin with a near infrared setting. And I think I'm right in saying I've never had a single scar. I've never had a single uh, bad result ever because yeah. everything is, is calmed very well. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so when we look at the Dermalux and we, we look at treating aging, um, how essentially does it work? And do you feel that just using, let's say, just using the Dermalux Triwave as an anti-aging tool is enough? Or would you recommend to combine it with other things, other technologies available? I think I would combine it with other things available. Um, as to what I would combine it with would be dependent on my patient in front of me, but there are some things that are universal as well. I think we touched on it before, skincare, yes, that's universal yeah. because it's a way of nourishing the skin. You can take oral supplements of vitamin A, you can have chicken livers with your dinner, whatever, all these vitamin A's are, uh, molecules are stored in lipid droplets, yeah. most likely uh, intracellular lipid droplets in hepatic stellate cells in the liver. The skin is very low priority for vitamin A in, in, in the body. So other areas like the eye will get it first and then the skin. That's why it's important to use it topically on the skin as well. So that's definitely number one, the skincare. Yeah. Um, not just the nourishment, but the protection in the form of sun protection mm -hmm. as well. Um, plenty of hydration. Um, and then yes, the Dermalux as well. So if we can modulate the signaling in the cell that determines the production of energy, we might be able to influence, as I said, the lifespan of certain cells in many, many different types of skin conditions. And this has been demonstrated uh, in its anti-aging effects in terms of collagen metabolism and collagen production. And when we talk about anti-aging, it's, uh, it's important to define what you mean by it because I think it means different things to different people. But I think most people will, will, will say it includes how much collagen there is, how much elasticity yeah. the skin is, how soft the skin is. So if you can guarantee that with something like the Dermalux influencing neocollagenesis, how, how brilliant is that? Yeah, yeah, true. So this is what I mean. It should be an integral part of every single treatment plan. Obviously, providing there's no contraindications to to having light therapy, um, but this it should be built into every single treatment plan that you do for your patients. Yeah, because um, it's so 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 important. Yeah, um, I mean, these these yeah. pathways that um, these signals are being sent through in the skin. So what what's really important and what's what's really quite impressive is they lead to as an increased cell proliferation. When you're using retinoids on your skin, what's the, what's the actual biological reason for using retinoids? It's to cause stem cell differentiation um, within the skin. That's why vitamin A can be considered a hormone, hormone by some people because it acts on the DNA. Retin there are retinoic acid receptors in the, by the nucleus of the cell that retinoic acid binds to. This then tells the epigenome to read the DNA and then that dictates the behavior of the cells. So you are literally dictating what the cells do with, with things like retinoids and by, by these signal transduction pathways. Um, and if you can use a Dermalux to help that cell proliferation and movement, especially things like fibroblasts, which are key cells in anti-aging, yeah. then you're getting a much better result. You know, if you modulate the levels of these immune mediators, such as interleukins, TNF alphas, um, you can also modulate things like growth factors, okay? Now, why do people do things like vampire facials and PRP? Because contained in alpha granules in the plasma in the blood, you have growth factors, but you also have interleukins, which are pro-inflammatory as opposed to pro-growth factor. Yeah. That's why when you actually study all the literature on PRP, there's actually very little to no evidence. When you look at studies that compare PRP uh, and say kneeling versus kneeling on its own, the end outcome clinically is actually almost identical because yes there's growth factors in the prp but there's also things that negate that and if you use the dermalux to signal these pathways and generate growth factors as a result of reading the dna you are generating these growth factors without the inflammatory response because you can also use a near infrared setting and that for me is incredible i mean it's it's almost like you've created a method of getting all the benefits of prp without taking blood from someone's arm without needing to buy an expensive centrifuge and you get the exact same growth factor release without any of the inflammation risk. So do you think we should maybe show a couple before and afters and these really um, highlight how 
well, effect of the tri-wave is at treating inflammation on the skin. Um, and then we can maybe go through um, some questions and maybe answer them. Okay. You happy with that? Yeah, go for it. Okay, cool. Right, let me screen share. Okay. So this um, is a really great before and after which we achieved um, in the clinic. Um, so this particular patient presented with really, really inflamed skin. They had basically been just using far too many actives on the skin. And obviously when you use too many actives, your skin goes into overdrive. So sometimes it's far too much for the skin. Um, so this was after a few Dermalux sessions. I actually don't think it was that many. I think it was maybe five or six um, yeah. once a week. And it was typically, we used um, near infrared for this um, on its own, nothing else. Okay. So you, did you, I, I, you cut out a little bit there for me. So did you say before the Dermalux there was a bit of skincare involved? Yeah. So they were using too many active products. So they were using okay. all sorts. There's salicylic in yeah. there. There was lactic in there. Yeah. There was retinol in there. Yeah. So the skin just went, whoa, what is going yeah. on? Um, and I think that's actually not that uncommon. A lot of people do tend to do that. Now, when you look at this particular example, yes, the patient used uh, a retinoid, the patient used salicylic acid, the patient used lactic acid. All three things, if used incorrectly, can cause what, which is key, excess inflammation or excess inflammatory response. The retinoid, you can get retinoid dermatitis or retinoid reactions because when your skin hasn't accustomed to it, there are not enough transmembrane receptors on the phospholipid bilayer of the cell to accept the entry of that much vitamin A. So it will hang around outside the cell and start to cause a fuss. Lactic acid and salicylic acid, they are um, acids as the name suggests. So if you put too much acid on, you're gonna cause too much damage. You know, things like um, these, th these acids, they are great potentially for taking damaged cells away because if it's a weak acid, you apply it topically onto the skin as an example, Certain cells in the skin will be healthy and certain cells won't be healthy. The ones that are healthy are strong enough to withstand certain types of attack. So certain AHAs, alpha hydroxy acids, certain acids will selectively remove damaged cells, but not healthy ones because they're not strong enough to remove the healthy ones, but they are strong enough to break through the damaged ones. But you do too much of that, too much concentration, too many frequent applications, etc., you might end up with this sort of appearance. It's, it's, it's just an inflammatory response because the skin is being pummeled, it's being pounded far too much. Yeah. And after just a few sessions of the Dermalux, you look at what happens when you control inflammation. Yeah, That's right. why I think the Dermalux is, is so incredible. It's, it's allowing people to react to treatment in a way that children do as opposed to adults. And I could talk about that for days, but that's such a huge, huge groundbreaking thing you know I, I can't believe that, it, that it's possible actually yep. and it's very difficult to do that without a Dermalux. Yep absolutely and then here's another one so clearly on the the left hand side there is a lot of inflammation yeah. and then obviously look at how much that's calmed down um, after a series of treatments. Yeah and again you know it's it's inflammation. Yeah. What a surprise it's it's another case of the skin trying to communicate to you through outwardly appearance that something is wrong. Yeah. So when you listen to that and you start to use that 830 nanometer setting to calm everything down, you allow the skin to actually do what it wants to do. So one, one of the things that happens when the skin is traumatized too much, one of the things that one of, one of the reasons scar formation takes place or any kind of inflammatory response takes place because the trauma is so big, the skin thinks, what, what on earth is going on here? Everyone is panicking. So all they, they, they don't think things through and they just rush into decisions. And so that's why they think, right, let's form a load of collagen and just make a shield to protect us because we don't know what's going on. As I said before, that's why collagen, that's why scar tissue is collagen. It is exactly, it's, it's collagen just like in a, in a healthy child that has soft bouncy skin. The difference is that in a scar tissue, it's all in one line mm -hmm. on top of each other. So it's, it's very protective and it has strength when it's on top of each other. But when it's like this in a basket weave, it's like a trampoline. If you look at the fibers of a trampoline, they crisscross. And when you stand in the middle, they, they bounce up and down. So no wonder collagen like this is bouncy and it looks like someone's had a lot of anti-aging treatment. But when it's like that, it's very rigid, it can't move and it looks like a scar. Yeah. Would you say that inflamed skin is quite a popular skin condition? I mean, in the clinic, we do see a lot of this. I don't know whether it's because we're up north 
Um, but it is very, you know, I, I mean, that's why I think the Wi-Fi cut out because it's literally just started hailstone and it was sunny like five minutes ago. So I had to put the light on. But anyways, so is it just the fact that we're obviously up north and the weather is the weather is not great, obviously, up here, but it's, it is, a, it, from my experience, it's a very common skin condition. Well, it's it's common because there's such a lack of education in, in in everything we know to do with, say, dermatology and skin conditions and cosmetic treatments, etc. And people aren't aware that certain things can cause inflammation or aren't good for them, shall we say. And they aren't aware of what inflammation actually means in the skin, in our body, etc., etc. So I think it's, it's more to do with a, a lack of understanding, which you know you kind of expect because not everyone walks around uh, having gone through medical school or dental school or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's our job to, to help them. And I think when, when you talk to them about what you're doing, you know, I will often, often talk to people why I've chosen this setting. Uh, you know, some people might find it boring, but actually when I explain it to my patients that you know, I'm gonna use this setting to control your immune response so that you don't end up looking like this or this, they appreciate that very much. And when they see that inflammation reducing or not coming up to the same extent it was before, they, they start to trust you a lot more as well because you're explaining as you're going along and you're correct in everything that you do because you're proving it by reducing inflammation and as a result, reducing their skin condition too. Yeah, I think obviously you hit the nail on the head there. Education is key. So obviously one of the, the best tips we could probably give you is to talk your patient through each step of the journey and um, yeah. to let them know why you're doing that. You know, they need to know. Um, yeah. And a lot, a lot of patients are really, really clued up. I mean, they'll often come into the clinic and they'll already have read up everything about something and they're like, I want that. And you're like, okay, well, why do you want that? Yeah. You know, it's, it's your job as a so practitioner to, to direct them in the right path of what they need for their, their problem. Yeah, I, I think the, a, a useful and helpful perspective to have is a patient will come in and ask for a treatment X or treatment Y or treatment Z. That's not what they want. That's the means they have chosen to achieve a particular end. You know, patients are really, at the end of the day, coming to you because they want to look more attractive. Let, yeah. Let's be honest, that's basically the fundamental reason they're coming. That might mean different things. It might mean look younger, look older, look whatever but that's the end goal that they all want and they have come to you saying can I have filler can I have led therapy can I have whatever because they think that's the way they will achieve that end of looking more attractive or looking younger which is, I suppose is the same thing in some people mm -hmm. so it's your job to understand that realize that this is the end that they actually want and they've asked for this means to achieve that end but actually, I know because of my better understanding of all the treatments, of all the, the biology, et cetera, that this means would be better for them rather than that. And it, it's, just a, it's just a game of trying to convince them that this is better for them or that's better for them and, and, and being honest with them. Yeah, definitely. So should we maybe I'll ask you some questions that obviously people have put in the chat. Do you yeah. have that? Yeah. Should we go okay. through some hints and tips? Because I know. Yeah. Yeah, we can do that first. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you know, we, we've had a dermatologist for quite some time um, and there are some some things we've I've personally seen and worked out and I'm sure Vanessa has too. So if anyone's using the Dermalux already, um, one of the, the common things that I see people doing wrong, especially on photos that they post online, is the distance between the LED and the skin. OK, if you double the distance to the LED, it doesn't mean the intensity of the light or the amount of light reaching the skin halves. It goes down by more than half. So the further away you get, the less intense the light is, but by a lot more. It, if you want to be technical, it's a negative logarithmic curve. So when you maintain that distance as close as possible, you're going to get the best result. Always keep it as close as you possibly can. Now, I admit it's difficult on the face because your face isn't completely flat, but as, as, as close as you can get to that by wrapping the LED panels around the face, the better off you're going to be. Um, and if you're going to use the Dermalux as a post-treatment um, healing, inflammatory response mediator, whatever, what I always do is I will set the Dermalux up with the arm reaching out next to the patient ready. So as soon as I have finished with the patient, say it's microneedling, as soon as I've lifted that roller off the patient's face, Next to my hand, the Dermalux is already there, and I just put that down and I grab the Dermalux and put it straight away. You want, you want minimum time between whatever treatment you're doing for them and the near infrared setting or whatever setting you're, you're using. 
For instance, yeah. plastic surgeons will do a, a surgical lift, a first surgical facelift, and immediately put the patient under the dermalux. Mm -hmm. The quicker you can settle that inflammation, then the better off your patient is. Yeah. So minimize the time, if you can, between finishing treatment and using the dermalux. Um, I, as you said, we're up north. Um, I'm not currently, but- um, Here you are. I said, yeah, well, not as north as you. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, <laughs> but one problem I have is I'm always cold. I actually, I actually, when I go to work, I actually take my own heater. A blanket. It's that, yeah, and a blanket as well, Glitter. because it's that cold in the room. Yeah. But if I'm using a Dermalux, I'll turn them off because those fans on the back of the LED panels are working overtime to reduce the amount of heat being generated by the LEDs. If they can't do that, you're not going to get an efficient use of the system. So if your room is boiling hot, you, you're going to struggle to let the Dermalux do its thing. So my advice would be to, is to not do what I do and make the room boiling hot. Or if you're going to, let it cool down before you turn it on and, and, and you actually use it. Yeah. Um, the other good and, tip is obviously to switch it off at the end of the day. That's another yes, one. Yes, I <laughs> get to turn it off. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I it left off. it on all night as well. Yeah, no. Yeah, but <laughs> make sure you well. turn That's it off one. properly at good. the screen and then obviously yeah. at the back of the machine and then at the wall as well. Yeah. So it's a health and safety um, hazard more than anything. It is. Yeah, don't do what I do. Yeah, definitely um, not. And on, on, on when you use Dermalux, there's a little sort of iPad uh, thing yeah. on, on the back where you control everything. Now, what if I can, what I will do, I will just cover that up, say with some cling film or whatever I've got, because if you're doing it post-treatment, you're going to have gloves for whatever you're you're doing, injecting, um, needling, laser, whatever yeah. feels. Um, so if you touch that screen with the glove, you're going to have to then wipe it afterwards. But yeah. obviously, it's, it's an electronic device. You don't want to get moisture in there in case it causes any damage. So if you can if you can cover that screen up, personally, I think that's easier because you can touch yeah. that still with your glove on, and yeah. then again, you just you just throw the cling film away, and that's a lot easier. Yeah, um, it's just like if I'm in surgery and I'm I'm typing my notes, the nurse will put cling film over the keyboard or a cover over the keyboard so I can treat the patient immediately do my notes while it's still in my head and then at the end she just throws away the, the cover over the top. Yep. Um, um, go another good tip I was going to say is when you're putting the goggles on obviously you we, we sterilize everything so I yeah. tend to wipe things down with obviously wipes in the clinic and um, well we, we obviously get the team doing that um, is to put cotton pads under obviously where you're putting the goggles because sometimes if if there's still chemicals present on the goggles and that goes into someone's eye that's obviously going to cause irritation so I don't know actually maybe Louise can answer this at the end whether there's a specific type of cleaning product that you would recommend for the goggles I just find that I well the best thing to do is to sort of obviously half the cotton pads and then cover it over the eyes that way yeah um, Shall I just add in there? Well, um, hello. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, the um, you can actually clean with really anything, any wipes and sprays. But of course, we always say just not to use any um, sprays directly onto the device. So they're going to get into the device or into the fans, as we said. But yes, it is safe to do that. Yeah, um, I just use canal wipes, I think, is we fine, yeah. Any alcohol, antibacterial products, because the devices are medically certified, obviously they've been through very stringent testing, um, but also we have to ensure that they can be sterilised safely without um, degrading the machine in any way or without creating any damage to the machine. Yeah. Um, I would also add, um, I think, Vanessa, you said earlier, why is it important to understand the, the skin anatomy and things like that? If, if you do do that, if you decide to go and read about those sorts of things, you understand that in the electron transport chain where this red light interacts, the molecule that is a photo acceptor for the Dumlux, the target, is, as I said, cytochrome C oxidase. This is a molecule which requires other things such as iron and, and, and copper. If these are deficient, you're going you're gonna to struggle to do anything. So that's why... Um, I would also recommend looking at some kind of supplementation or topical application of these things beforehand um, to actually maximize what the Dermalux can do for that patient. So, for example, if um, someone is anemic, which you will look at in their medical history and they've got less iron, they are not just less able to transport oxygen around the body, but the oxygen that is transported, when it reaches the electron transport chain, which is it, the point of oxygen, that's why we need to breathe it. If there's not enough iron for these chains to, to be there, then you're going to struggle. So I will sometimes even supplement, and I, I know in the, in the guide that I write for my patients, I even recommend certain types of multivitamins, which have certain forms of these 
micronutrients um, so that all the building blocks are there for these things to occur. Um, copper as well. So you need the brain, especially is very exceptionally rich in copper. Uh, and it's needed in skin as well. Copper is one of the biggest regulators or signaling molecules for collagen production near collagenesis. And cytochrome C oxidase relies on copper two and copper three in order to transport electrons to the final block in the chain that gen generates energy for the cell. Now, you can supplement with, with copper as well, but again, as I said, the brain is exceptionally rich. That's gonna be the first priority for the body. So topical application of copper is possible as well as in a preparation phase. Um, I would use something like copper peptides, um, which is a form of GHK copper, um, and that's going to help collagen production in, in anything that you do, as well as the actual ability to generate energy, which you know, any cell doing anything needs energy. Yeah. Um, so pay attention to the patient's medical history. If, if something missing, if they have an absorption disorder, anemia, whatever, then you, you need to consider putting those things in there prior to treatment for a better result. Okay, perfect. Um... Shall we move on to questions, do you think? Sure, yeah, I think that's yeah. good time. Okay, so this is a really good question. It actually, we were gonna talk about this as well. Um, so how do you rate ho um, home LED masks? What a great question. That's a fantastic <laughs> question. I don't, know who, I don't know who said that, but that's a <laughs> high five to them. Yeah. Um, it's, it, what you should, the best thing to do with an LED mask, it, when you get it, is put it straight in the bin. So. Part of the reason that Dermalux works is, as I said before, it, you need to create activation energy for any chemical change to occur. What, what is chemistry? Chemistry is the science of change. This thing changes from A to B, but nothing will ever occur if the energy is not put into the system for that change to then take place. But as an example, you can have a, a, a pile of wood sitting on the ground. There's the atmosphere is around it, the oxygen is around it it doesn't spontaneously combust unless you heat it. That heat is just a method of putting energy into the wood so it can then react with the oxygen and, and burn. If your skin is, if you're trying to do things with the skin, you need to be able to achieve this activation energy for something to happen. If it's below the activation energy, nothing will happen. If it's well above, you're gonna cause damage. That's, you're talking about laser at that point. Somewhere in between is where LED therapy is. So if your LEDs cannot generate the right activation energy, you're wasting your time and you're not gonna do anything. These LED masks are not powerful enough to generate the correct activation energy for these changes to occur. And that's why it's, it's just not worth it at all. I mean, the Dermalux, if I'm not mistaken, I'm sure Louise can correct me, there's a proprietary technology in these LEDs, so no one can really copy them. As well as that, straight from the factory when they're manufactured, aesthetic technology, the people behind Dermalux, they get the first dibs, they get the best LEDs. So how on earth is anyone even supposed to compete with that? Yeah, that's, um, I think, yeah, it's correct. We've obviously, we've invested a lot, you know, over the 10 years that we've been going, it's it's always been, you know, we wanted our proprietary LED technology. Yes, we've got a great in-house team that's able to sort of source that, Dale, with his background um, in, in the LED industry as well. So um, yes, we've been very fortunate to have the people around us that's enabled us to do that. But for us, it's about the results and that's, you know, what we've been discussing all the way through, so. Yeah. Yeah. So there's no result with an LED mask, essentially. Yeah, you're just wasting your time, really. Yeah. Okay, um, next question. Is there any compelling visual results on mature skin, 70 plus, by, I'm assuming, probably just using the, the LED? There, there, is there um, a, a visible result for people of that age? Is that the question? Yes. Okay, there is a visible result, but there are certain requirements for that visible result to occur, and the requirements are the same, actually, for anyone, regardless of age. If you're, if you're telling the skin to renew, to rejuvenate, et cetera, certain things are needed. As yeah. long as those things are there, it's gonna happen, okay? So it might be that different people with different starting points have different pre-Dermalux um, preparation protocols, but the actual Dermalux, yes, it will definitely create a change as long as the this, this, this skin allows that change to occur. So as an example, um, if you know the person is malnourished, they've got a really bad diet, that needs to improve. If they don't drink enough water, there's not enough hydration in there, that needs to improve. If they're not protecting their skin from the sun, that needs to improve. All these things, all these boxes have to be ticked in everyone, regardless of age, for them to see a result. Totally. 
Um, we've answered this question, is it beneficial to use LED after microneedling? We went through that. Um, I, would, um, I, would, I would add to that potentially. Okay. Um, so it is beneficial to use after microneedling. I will use it if possible in 100% of cases. However, um, my personal protocol for post needling would be the blue 415 for antibacterial and 830 for the um, settling of the Im immune response. And as I said, it will be immediately after. Okay. Once I personally take the Dermalux off, I've then got, I give myself a maximum of four minutes to then apply my topical products. I will only ever, 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 unless scientific literature changes with new evidence, I'll only ever apply high weight uh, hyaluronic acid. Because if you apply a foreign object, uh, even vitamin C types, such as um, ascorbyl tetraisopalmitate, there has been evidence that patients that have these kind of things applied have been hospitalized due to granulomatous infections. And when you use a low weight hyaluronic acid as well, that is incredibly pro-inflammatory, pro-scar tissue in certain instances, even pro-cancer metastasis. That's why there is a patent that exists which allows you to use low weight HA purposely inflaming the skin to do things like removing collagen from people. Why you'd want to do that, that's something for another time, but I will only ever apply high weights as high as possible. Ideally, I'd like to get to about 3,000 kilodaltons. Okay. Um, do, do, how often do you use Dermalux for acne? Um, ideally, in, in, in every case, because if you look at it from the patient perspective, all you want is a result. Mm -hmm. So you want something that gives you that as quick as possible, as risk-free as possible, and as effortlessly as possible. Yeah. And the Dermalux ticks all those boxes. Yeah. Um, in terms of how often would you space it? Probably twice a week for the first few um, weeks. I would, I would base it on an individual basis. But as an average, I might say twice a week for, uh, say, four weeks. And then once a week for the three weeks following that. So you have, say, seven weeks of treatment. And yeah. then I would precede that seven weeks with, with good skin care, with some protection, and address any specific skin problems that they have as well. So if they're overproducing sebum, I will try and do something to reduce that sebum. Maybe use zinc in the um, in in their skincare somewhere, apply an oil so the body thinks there's too much oil, so it stops the sebum production, things like that to settle the skin. And then I would start those those seven weeks if possible. Perfect. Does it help with keloid scarring? It can do. Um, so we know that um, you you can adequately assess photomodulatory effects with any kind of scientific testing nowadays. Now fibroblasts in culture have shown physiological cyclical patterns of pro-collagen type one upregulation and matrix metalloproteinase one, MMP1 downregulation that can be emphasized by LED treatment. So when you are pro-collagen and um, uh, sort of anti uh, MMP, which is collagen breakdown, you, you can control these sort of things. And keloid scars, again, are an inflammatory response if you get that anti-inflammatory um, wavelength in there, 830, as soon as possible, you can control this. Now, if you can't control that and the keloid scar is, is formed, that's actually sometimes when I would go back to my low weight HA, I would inject that. And then that will give me roughly a 50% reduction in the keloid scar over about two to three weeks. And that's what low weight HA has been patented to do. Okay, great. Post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, do you use red or just near infrared? So I will post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, I will ideally, whatever treatment it is they're having, let's say a peel as an example, I will try and get them on the near infrared leading up to that so that their skin is calmed before they even start. And then I will try and do the uh, near infrared. Now the red depends on what it is that I'm, I'm doing really, um, but at least near infrared and if possible, the blue, because if there is a bacterial problem, that even if you settle the inflammation, if there's still bacteria, when they go home, that bacteria can then cause more inflammation. So yeah. I would try and be antibacterial and I would also try and be anti-inflammatory. Okay, and um, what's the protocol with facials, Dermalux first or after? Um, so I would never do something like a facial followed by the Dermalux. Every substance has a, something called a refractive index, which means it can bend like this way or that way. Vitamin C, you know, a lot of people will know vitamin C is ascorbic acid. Those of you that like to read a bit more will call it L-ascorbic acid. And those of you that read a lot more than that will know that the L stands for levorotary. There is also D-ascorbic acid, dextrorotary ascorbic acid. These just mean it will bend the light left or right when the light hits that molecule. So if you're putting 
any kind of molecule on the skin, any kind of liquid on the skin, whatever, and the dermalux is then hitting that, it's now being scattered like a prism. So you're reducing clinical efficacy. That's why I would not put anything on the skin after microneedling and put the dermalux on straight away. So I don't mind using the dermalux when there's nothing on the skin, but I will avoid it if there's anything on the skin. That's my personal preference and that's you know, what the scientific literature supports. Yeah, um, I, I think it will depend as well on, on the ingredients that were maybe used in that facial treatment and whether you, you've obviously taken them off and it's dry skin as well. You know, that, that does play a part. Yeah. Um, how many sessions will we need to use for skin rejuvenation with the flex in elderly patients who do not want to try injectables on microneedling? Okay, so the flex is going to take a lot more because it's, uh, even though it has the same type of LEDs, it is not the same power. It doesn't, it's not so, uh, as big a machine, so it doesn't have as big a, an ability to dissipate heat, for instance. So there's only a certain amount it can do. So it's great for people that can't physically make it into the clinic for whatever reason. They can rent it from your clinic, something like that. But it is going to need a lot more. As to how many more, I think that's so variable and it depends on where that patient is starting from. You can shorten the amount of sessions they need by making sure that they have pre-treatment preparation with the basic vitamins A, C, E, and B5 in the skin with good sun protection, with good water intake. So when the uh, red light hits the skin and causes all these changes, the cells are well fueled to be able to accept those changes and create their new products like HA, elastin, um, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, well, this is a, a, another point. So, you know, if you've got an elderly patient and they don't want to do any injectables, they don't want threads, they don't want microneedling, they want the bare minimum, they have to also bear in mind that they are probably going to get the bare minimum result as well if they don't want to do uh, all these things. So you really do need to manage that person's expectations really, really carefully. Yeah, of course. Um, okay. What type of damage can you do to the skin if used incorrectly? I'm not sure if this is applicable to microneedling or if this is applicable to the Dermalux, but there's, there's really not a lot of damage you can obviously do with the Dermalux. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's not technically, as far as I'm aware, such a thing as too much, shall we say, red light. And if there is, you, you, you kind of use something different. You use the blue light to kind of counter it and you settle the skin that way. Yeah. Um, are there any conditions that can be made worse by using the wrong light? thinking if you use red in acne patients with post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation? Um, you, you can technically not get the effect you're after by using the wrong light. So for example, if you are applying certain products onto the skin and then you use a particular wavelength of light that you're not meant to, you, you could get some sort of reaction. For instance, if you apply a really strong retinoid on the skin and then you apply something like red light, for instance, that's, that's potentially gonna cause some sort of reaction and you want it to calm down. Uh, if that happens, you, know, you, you wanna reduce the concentration of retinoids that you're applying. You want to get them on the 830 to calm the skin down. You wanna get them on sun protection, so reduce the inflammatory response as a result of retinoid dermatitis. Um, it's something that's very, very individual. Um, you know, if, for those that are unsure, if you were to get the Dermalux there, I believe there is a, a sort of manual that comes with it and it will give you a rough idea of what you can use, what you should use with caution and what you should never use. Mm -hmm. Acids, ne never, no. That's yeah, it's thing. in there, it's in the yeah. table. In, in okay, the yeah, manual. so you, you do get it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, can you imagine someone sold you a machine and you didn't get a manual how to use it? It's not Ikea. <laughs> <laughs> um, any antifungal effects as well as antiviral effects? Antifungal, I don't think there's much evidence for something like that, um, but there is antibacterial, antiviral for sure. Yeah. Can it treat acne rosacea and dermatitis? It, it, it can help those things, but it, as it, will it cure it? Not necessarily. If we look at those things, for instance, let's take rosacea as, as an example. Rosacea at the end of the day is a, is a, a barrier function disorder. Dermalux is, is not going to generate a stratum corneum for your epidermis. It will not create a barrier for you. It can settle things down. It can help your cells function. It can reduce the bacterial load. Mm. But things like that barrier function come from just generally healthy skin, skin that's well-fed, skin that's protected from the sun, skin that's hydrated. So Dermalux in combination with these things can you know, alleviate conditions like rosacea, for example. Yeah. Um, acne, again, there's so many different things that, would lead, that can lead to things like acne. Um, Dermalux obviously can help. It can reduce the quantity of bacteria reduce the quantity of p acnes 
Um, but then, you know, sometimes acne is related to hormonal conditions. If there's a lot of testosterone, that's why teenagers get it a lot. Yeah. If there's hyperkeratinization from some other condition that they have, all these things need to be taken into account to determine whether or not this person can be treated. Even if they can't be fully treated or fully cured, they can be helped by the Dermalux because they, it will still do things like reducing the bacterial load. Yeah, it's another good point. Obviously, um, I've seen a lot of men come into the clinic who, you know, bodybuilding and whatnot and um they take steroids and obviously if they take steroids that then obviously can lead to acne um and sometimes they come in and they've got it like all over their shoulders all over their back um so would you say that dermalux will help with that um bearing in mind if they've taken steroids obviously for a period of time it can help in at least a short term in at least a sort of alleviation of the symptoms but it will not necessarily act in such a way as to prevent future occurrence um, so if, if you distill what the cause of that person's acne is, part of your treatment isn't just to use the Dermalux, it's to educate your patient and say, look, the acne is simply an effect and this is the cause of that effect. Yeah. You need to constantly bear that in mind, otherwise it's going to reoccur. So it goes hand in hand with educating your patient and it's not something to stick them under and leave them. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, so what topicals do you use on the skin after needling? I only ever use high weight molecular acid, uh, hyaluronic acid. Um, as high a weight as possible. Um, if I, the closer I can get to something like 3000 kilodaltons, the, the better I am. Now that is far too big to penetrate a facial pore normally, which is why I don't mind using it for needling. When you needle, depending on again, which scientific paper you quote, the puncture you make in the skin is on average the width of around four cells, which is in terms of molecular size, it's quite large. So that is okay to get high weight hyaluronic acid in there, relatively speaking. Um, but other than that, I don't do anything else because I, you know, there is literature, there is evidence to that shows case reports even of patients being hospitalized because the wrong ingredients were used. Even ingredients which you think are good, certain types of vitamin C, as an example, and types of hyaluronic acid, which are low weight, they have been hospitalized because of those things as well. So I, I will not be taking that risk for my patients and I will only be applying what I know to be safe. Yeah. Can you use LED after PRP microneedling? Um, technically, yes. I mean, you could use the NIR, um, but at the same time, the, the interesting thing with that is the PRP is being used to derive growth factors out of the alpha granules contained in, in human plasma. But you can stimulate growth factor production using the Dermalux by stimulating the mitochondria, which are the energy centers of the cells. When you do that and your body recognizes, okay, we're, we're making energy, we, we've got an energy requirement, that must mean we're doing a lot of things. That must mean we, we, we've got to grow with our environment, with our whatever stimulating this growth. And so growth factors will naturally be transcribed from the DNA to cope with that. So you will also get growth factors with, with the Dermalux as well, in which case, you know, do you, do you still need to be doing the PRP? But as, a, you know, as in, can you combine them technically? I suppose, yes. But again, if there's too much blood on the skin, that's going to scatter the light. And actually hemoglobin in the blood is something that can absorb um, wavelengths of light and it has in its own absorption spectra so if that blood is all over the skin the skin's not going to see most of that light unfortunately so it depends on how it's done yeah can you use dermalux for 10 minutes before microneedling and 10 minutes after um, you could technically if you wanted to use it before in in shall we say antibacterial way um, uh, an anti-inflammatory way with the six yeah. with these 415 and, and, and the 830 but you know ideally before you'd needle you're going to clean the skin anyway so there shouldn't be any bacteria or, or problem or dirt on the skin anyway um, and in terms of the anti-inflammatory aspect yes you can settle the inflammation but as soon as you needle that puncture of the skin is going to be causing some sort of inflammation anyway which means you're still going to be using it after the treatment so what's the point of using it before i will just carry out your standard preparation protocol um, in terms of cleansing the skin, et cetera, and then do your standard needling and then use, in, in my personal opinion, blue and near infrared for 10 minutes combined. Okay. Um, would you recommend a course as a pre-treatment to invasive lasers such as CO2? Um, not necessarily. I mean, potentially you could use it pre-treatment uh, in near infrared, the 830, to settle the inflammation down so there's less risk of PIH post-treatment. And then you could also use the same thing post-treatment um, of, say a couple of days after, maybe day three after if you wanted. Um, and you could do a course of say four sessions each around 48 hours apart. 
uh, and that would cause much better healing as well. And that's really useful for darker skinned um, patients like myself because we're much more at risk of PIH. And actually on, on that note, on the um, near infrared setting um, and you know, all these wavelengths that the Dermalux produces, um, in my opinion, um, to, you know, to everyone that has made the Dermalux, and I mean this constructively, I, in my opinion, I think even you guys don't realize how good your own technology is because I think, I wish I could drag you all into a room and say, well, you can actually also do this and this and this, and you've missed this market and this market. I think there's so much more you can do. And I wish I could, I could get you guys to do more as well. Well, you know, it's th this is a whole education, you know, and this is why we wanted to do these webinars. You know, for us, it's about sharing knowledge. You know, you know, we're, we're a manufacturer, of course, and yes, we have clinical experience, but it's about the people that we have around us, our clients, you know, our, our colleagues in the industry. Um, and that's how we develop and grow. You know, if we, if we yeah. want to be the best, then we have to work with our partners. So, you know, absolutely, we're, we're always open to that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, there's loads of questions. I think, um, you know, we've been going on quite a bit now. So <laughs> that was oh, kind of fantastic. fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe we'll, I mean, maybe we'll do like a couple more and then um, and we, we can, because I mean, a couple of them we've um, we've already gone through. And we will keep all of these on file anyway. So if there's any that we haven't been able to answer, um, then we can obviously we'll we'll be in touch with everybody to, to respond. Abs, this is a good one. How does blue light from LED differ from harmful blue light, obviously, that your, your phone or computer screen um, emits? So when you're emitting it from the screen, you, you can't guarantee which wavelength it's, it's going to be. Um, when it's from a Dermalux, you know it's going to be 415, and that's there's scientific evidence behind that having an antibacterial, uh, antiviral, etc. effect. So when you don't know what the wavelength is, you don't know what effect there's going to be. Actually, typically on that, so it's a question that we do get asked a lot, and we've actually got an information sheet we've put together. Um, but typically, um, they're using wavelengths in maybe the 450 to 470 sort of spectrum because they're just an off-the-shelf LED that's used in general lighting, whereas the 415 is measured is um, specifically um, manufactured for medical application, so it's not used in a general lighting sort of sense. So you're right, though, it's about the control of that. So we're delivering a controlled amount of energy over a, a period of time, whereas people can sit in front of their, their laptops and, you know, and their phones for hours and hours, so there's no control sort of over that so yeah it's it's a different kind of light but it's a good question and yeah. it does come up a lot yeah um what oh example of a high weight hyaluronic acid um well that's something which you need to ask a manufacturer of ha and say what is your weight quite a few won't actually say in which case i'm never buying their products because they don't uh, know yeah partly <laughs> possibly yeah um but one example is uh toscani ha3 which i do quite like that is 3000 kilodaltons um bcn mesotherapy products in spain they do some ha products which have, have different weights i will try and use the 3.5 percent which is a higher weight it's not quite as heavy as the, the tkn um but there's a few, couple different options they're, they're just two yeah yeah Brilliant. I think we can, yeah. we, can, we can stop there. That's probably enough. I need a glass of water for a while. <laughs> there, um, there are, um, I think a lot of the questions, I've been watching them as well, and a lot of them we are... Um, uh, we have sort of gone through anyway, or we've touched on, but like I say, we will keep these. So if we haven't managed to answer them all, um, then we will try and get back to everybody. You know, we've got another webinar again next week and um, yeah, we can touch on that. But I just want to say thank you so much to you both. It's been absolutely fantastic. It's been a real education. I think from an LED phototherapy point of view, from a treatment point of view, from a protocol point of view, it's uh, hopefully everybody's, you know, benefited from this. Um, like I say, if, there's are, if there are further questions, we can answer those later. But um, the final episode will be at the same time next week. So Thursday, 18th of March at 4 p.m. And we're going to be touching on more of the commercial aspects of the, um, the LED treatment um, and sharing some revenue generating ideas as well. But the registration for episode three is going to be open from tomorrow. So don't forget to put your place on that. Um, and yeah, just good to say thank you very much again to you both. It's been, yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having us. No, no problem at all. So, uh, well, thanks everyone as well. And um, hopefully see you all next week. Yeah, see you next week. Thank yeah. you. Take care. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.